Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Flow Virometry Sorting, B-Cell Cloning and Evaluation, Cytoflex, SRT, and Vital Research. I am Marie Stone of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. To learn more, visit Beckman.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box located at the bottom of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. In addition to submitting questions, we ask that you participate in the interest poll at the bottom right of your screen. Click on the option that best describes your answer. I'd like to now welcome our speakers. John Tiggs, Principal Associate in Medicine, Harvard Medical School. James McCracken, Commercial Product Manager, Flow Sorters at Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. And Cecilia Cavazzoni, Research Fellow at the SAGE Lab, Transplantation Research Center, Brigham and Women's Hospital. John, James, and Cecilia, you may now begin your presentation. All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending this uh, this webinar sponsored by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Uh, my name is James McCracken, and I am a commercial product manager for Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, and I'm responsible for our flow sorters, including the Cytoflex SRT. We're going to highlight some work today done in the Boston area in the, with John Tiggs and uh, Dr. Cecilia Cavazzoni. Uh, and how they're using the Cytoflex SRT in some work in flow virometry sorting and some B cell and cloning, uh, cloning and evaluation projects there in the laboratories. Uh, I'd like to give a quick introduction to the Cytoflex platform overall and what that looks like. So the Cytoflex platform is a commercially available flow cytometer platform that's based on APD detection technology. Avalanche photodiodes, highly sensitive and very small in size, uh, resulting in really small benchtop sized instruments. Initially, we launched these as analyzers. Uh, we currently have three different models covering one to six lasers, up to 21 color detection um, with automation integration possible and plate loaders. The next evolution for us uh, was moving this into a cell sorting platform, trying to keep that small size and ease of operation that the Cytoflex analyzers were known for. Uh, with the SRT, we uh, top out at a four laser 15 color system uh, with four populations total possible to sort with mixed mode sorting capabilities and the ability to sort in up to 384 well plates. Now, another nice thing about this is these are easily parameter matched to analyzers. So when you have a laser and bandpass match between your analyzer and your sorter, you can easily transfer your experiments between analyzer and sorter uh, without having to redraw regions or recreate statistics. So what is the Cyoflex SRT? In, in a very base sense, we tried to make it the Cytoflex that sorts. So you see the same things you see with your Cytoflex analyzer because of its similar performance and similar optical components uh, and makes it a really sensitive sorter and in fact is more sensible, sensitive than many flow cytometry analyzers that are on the market. And again, making that direct link between the analyzer and the sorter platform. Uh, just like the Cytoflex analyzers, we've tried to simplify and automate workflow uh, wherever possible. Right, so automating drop delay determination to make sure your sort remains stable, uh, keeping that small footprint, getting a system that's ready to sort quickly uh, and, and uh, you know, easy one-click interfaces to get, uh, to get quality control done and get your sort set up ready. Uh, 
this is an example slide of what uh, configurations are currently available for the Cytoflex SRT. Uh, we have violet, blue, yellow, green, and red lasers available uh, and multiple configurations to, to meet the needs of your lab now and in the future. Uh, important to note, these are field upgradable uh, and optical filters from your Cytoflex analyzer are exchangeable with what's in the Cytoflex SRT. I think one of the important things to highlight for the work you're about to see um, and, and for your own work is the high sensitivity that Cytoflex analyzers are known for. We've carried that over into the Cytoflex SRT cell sorter. All right, so this is just some example data with eight peak spherotech beads, which is kind of our standard. Uh, and you can see in the majority of our channels, we're able to see all eight of those peaks, uh, except in some of these longer Stokes shift uh, parameters in the violet laser. We've also carried that sensitivity over into scatter sensitivity uh, with violet side scatter. When you have a violet laser configuration active, uh, you can detect up to 200 nanometer polystyrene particles, so allowing us to get into sorting very small nanoscale particles. Uh, and of course, very high fluorescence uh, sensitivity because of the avalanche photodiode detection systems. One of the pieces of feedback that I think really uh, impresses me about Cytoflex Analyzer still is how much people enjoy Site Expert software. And so when we developed software for the Cytoflex SRT, we did not rewrite anything on this. We kept things very much in the Site Expert mold um, so that someone who knows Site Expert to begin with has a very short learning curve. Uh, things are going to look the same in terms of creating plots, creating regions just some extra icons to allow you to start sorting. Um, and of course, that's part of what makes it possible to turn these analysis experiments in easily into sorting experiments, taking those files directly from your analyzer and loading them into a sorter. And last thing I'll kind of say here before getting to the scientific meat of this talk that's, uh, that's the main point uh, is I think the, the result of all this work has resulted in a really fast adoption in shared resource settings, uh, such as in John's lab at Beth Israel Deaconess. Uh, this is an example from, uh, from another user's lab showing multiple researchers signing up to both run their own sorts or run sorts um, with supervision. Uh, so really fast adoption in these shared resource settings, I think as a result of these automated features and easy to interact with uh, software. Now, before we get to John and Cecilia, uh, I do have to say that the portions following this are just sponsored by Beckman Coulter. This is scientific content from this point on, non-promotional and purely for educational purposes. Right? So um, our products are, are have specific intended uses. The Cytoflex SRT is a research use only instrument that's clearly marked by us. Um, and that the views and opinions that are going to be uh, expressed by John and Cecilia are, uh, are their own and don't necessarily represent um, Beckman Coulter itself. And so now I'd like to turn it over to John Tiggs, Principal Associate in Medicine at Harvard Medical School and uh, important member of the shared research resource facility there at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. John? Thank you, James. So as James said, um, this is research use only. Just want to reiterate that so that there's no confusion on, on that on anybody's part. Um, so basically today we want to talk a little bit what's labeled here as flow virometry, but talking about virus-like particles. And so I did a little bit of searching and found, you know, this is obviously become such a hot topic with all the vaccinations that are happening these days uh, and with the past pandemic. So just found a few companies and how they're using these virus-like particles in order to tackle uh, vaccination and possibly uh, alleviate some of the issues that had uh, transpired during the time of COVID-19. So as you can see here, there's some using you know, what they call a shell and protruding domain for norovirus capsids. Um, there's another one using norovirus, uh, others using different types. 
And so this is something that as this grab popularity, um, I started thinking about a little bit more and started trying to see in flow cytometry how we could tackle this. And simply put, it was a, a something that had been done previously, and we'll get into that in a second. So here's what we were looking at. You see that there are different ways to form uh, virus uh, like particles uh, through bacteria, yeast, uh, plants. Uh, you know, I've seen Drosophila, mammalian cells is one of the more popular that, that we deal with. And so they're looked at for vaccination type purposes and cancer, infectious diseases, as I've already mentioned. Um, and so it's something that started to pique the interest, right? And I've been contacted uh, in different aspects of how can virus-like particles be be used? How can we characterize? How can we get them into more of a purified form? And you can see that in the upper left is that's one of the main things, right? The clarification, the purification, and what they're calling polishing. And so one of the tools that we've always had at our disposal is cell sorting. And so as a shared resource laboratory director um, this at, for a flow cytometry core, this is something I've been doing for a long time. And so that's the first thing that kind of popped into my head. And so as you can see here, as they administer, and the reason I put this slide up on the uh, right-hand side is simply to kind of tease a little bit what uh, Cecilia will be talking about and you know talking about immunity and the immune response. And so hopefully we can paint this entire picture of looking at this from the perspective of how do we get these virus-like particles? How can we make them pure? And then how can sorting go from the whole, you know, isolating to an actual effective vaccination? Um, so let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into that. So what's the big difference, right? Virus-like uh, particles versus the conventional vaccines that we know, whether, you know, uh, these are in the form of uh, mRNAs that, that have become very popular or the, the old kind of attenuated virus. So conventional vaccines are saying there's problems with uh, reversions to virulent forms, you know, toxicity with you know, immunocompromised individuals, can be problematic in the uh, elder populations, um, it, harder to kind of get out a huge yield. As we saw, there were some delays. So everybody started looking at these virus-like particles in order to put things with inside them uh, and they're not infectious. So you can actually develop an immune response uh, from the antigens and the, you know, that you may add to these or things that are put into the as subunits. Um, and it was found that they didn't have any kind of allergic reaction that you may get from a peg that was used in the formulation of the most recent vaccinations. Uh, safe for these immune compromised or for you know like we said the elder population and so less kind of um issues that that could be formed um they're still going to be obviously and we've seen some of them we can talk about that a little bit but they give the opportunity to be a lot more effective and easier to produce and change throughout different types of uh, vaccination needs so let's add to that and see how we did it. So now here's the thing. I started going back and thinking of some colleagues that I have, uh, Vera Tang here and Joshua Welsh and Jennifer Jones, um, and then a paper that we had done along with Dr. Garon, uh, where we started doing these, uh, looking at extracellular vesicles, looking at uh, retroviruses, um, and these were used for standardization and particles that we for reference and things that we could uh, do with the flow cytometer. And in those type things where we were looking for reference particles, you can see here that one of these is actually engineered retroviruses. This was a mouse leukemia virus um, that was from Vera Tang's lab that she worked with Joshua Welsh in order to start to characterize instrumentation, to standardize instrumentation for looking at extracellular vesicles. Well, it just so happens that viruses sit in the same realm, right? Same refractive index, um, sizing is basically the same. So the thought process is, well, if we can do this kind of work using, say, the Cytoflex S platform, then we should be able to translate this over to virus-like particles. We have a collaborator that uh, is at Boston University and works in the infectious disease department. 
And so they've been producing these virus-like particles for uh, way before the pandemic happened. And we had used some of these in our own studies. And you can see here, it's a, a simple um, taking of the, the virus-like particle in this particular instance being from uh, human uh, HIV, so human immunodeficiency virus. They are uh, added into a co-transfection with HEC293Ts. You take off the supernatant and, and you get a bunch of these virus-like particles with all the same aspects without the infectivity. So as I, you know, again, thinking about this, we went, okay, well, how about that classification? How about the purification? And so the classification we had already started doing in the sense of using the Cytoflex S platform and running these through certain uh, protocols in order to understand the size, the refractive index, and uh, the tagging. So these have fluorescent proteins. So what we did is we used a software known as, uh, sorry, we'll get to that in a second, um, just using a software to get that information. And so part of that was going to this characterization and purification, looking at the S, understanding what it could do, and then knowing that we had at our disposal the Cytoflex SRT, or as James so nicely put it, the Cytoflex that sorts. So having the same optical bench, our assumption, which happened to be true, is that we should be able to get very similar, if not exact same results. So complementary type platforms in order to advance the science. So we knew we can do things like this. This happens to be a uh, virus-like particle that we're looking on a scatter plot, um, and then looking at it using the software I'm about to talk a little bit more about, which is known as FCM Pass, in order to tease out the information of sizing. And then if we could duplicate that same thing on the platform that is the SRT, we could take this further and not just characterize, but we can move on to this purification stage. And so that's where our experiments kind of began. And it became very simple. So the first thing we needed to do was grab ourselves a set of uh, beads. These are NIST standard beads. They're polystyrene with known refractive index uh, and known sizing. So the, the nominal diameter is known along with its actual refractive index. And all this can be converted so that you understand um, the limits of detection for your particular instruments and possibly any corrections that can be made, whether by yourself or a service engineer. Um, so there are a multitude of things that have to be taken into consideration, um, which is way beyond the, the, uh, the breadth of this particular talk, but is things that need to be taken into consideration. And you can see that in many of the position papers, such as the uh, MISEV reports. But simply, uh, we were looking at our Cytoflex S, we did a calibration, we compared that to the calibration that was done on the SRT, and we had pretty similar results that we had anticipated previously, and now we were able to prove it. Now, I'm showing just an example of this, but we, uh, we do this every time that we set up an experiment um, and know that just like if you were doing your QC uh, and QA, you'd understand where things started to change. Well, we're monitoring that in this this is very helpful to do that with the bead set and the software. Um, our limited detection is slightly different, as you can see from the lines here on this bottom graph, which is the scatter diameter curve. Uh, and on a scatter plot, we're able to get a little bit better out of the Cytoflex S than we are the SRT. But we found when looking at the actual um, Earth's equivalent, so the uh, the or MESF, the equivocal uh, fluorochrome, insoluble fluorochrome, I think it is, and reference fluorochrome on the earth, uh, that we could see that the APDs and how they're detected through the instruments are, they are not, the, they are the same. It's not even complementary at this point. They are the, pretty much the same dead on. Uh, so we were able to move along with this and say, okay, well, let's characterize and then let's move it out. All right, so as you can see here, we were able to take what we had characterized previously from using the Cytoflex S and through other orthogonal methods, and we moved that to our Cytoflex SRT so that we could try and purify these populations. So by getting uh, these VLPs from our collaborator, as mentioned before, um, they are labeled with fluorescent proteins. One of them happens to be GFP, and the other one, TD tomato. Um, so we took these, as a separates each on their own 
and did a quick sort of the material. And so we were able to see here how we're taking this population that has this excess. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, why there's all this kind of negative um, populations in there also. It's twofold. One is there is a level of signal to noise ratio issue at the lower ends of detection. Hence, the limited detection needs to be determined. And also, there's going to be some discussed about what else that may possibly be. But as we sorted them, you can see here, we were able to increase the population. So all we're really trying to do is purify and get a, you know, a lower yield doesn't really matter to us as much as having a pure and uh, homogeneous population. But that never satisfies. I mean, we're like any good scientist. Um, if you show us something that works, our next thing is to ask what else we can possibly get. So what we did is we took those same things. We looked at the VLP GFPs and TD tomatoes. And what we wanted to do then is label them even further. So what we did is we took them and we added what is known as an ACO 490 dye from a company known as Acarella. This is a spin out from a lab uh, in the National University of Singapore. Um, these are lipid dyes, which are fluorogenic. So hence they must get in between the lipid bilayer of the VLPs and or an extracellular vesicle. And then they will become fluorescent. Here you can see these are some extracellular vesicles that we uh, isolated from red blood cells, labeled the membranes with the uh, ACO 490 dye, which has a similar uh, fluorescent submission as a chrome orange 525 on a cytoflex. We then took that dye and added it to our VLPs, which already had the fluorescent protein. And as you can see here, we get a double labeling of the virus-like particles. But we also get populations of, you know, the there on the chrome orange detector, which would be the ACO 490, that is not actual GFP. And as we started to look at these on the microscope, we realized that the dye is showing us that when you're culturing these, say with the HEC 293 T cells, and you're taking the supernatants, even though when you're doing a purification, you're purifying for a size and density that is similar to a VLP, hence EVs. So we were able to find that under doing microscopy, electron microscopy, that we could see extracellular vesicle populations also within the supernatant of these populations, hence the need to purify. So this, again, just proved to us that what we were actually looking at and trying to perform was, even if just for our own purposes, going to be useful. So we looked at the individuals. I did an overlay to show that, okay, in an overlay, we, they should separate very nicely. We shouldn't have a huge overlap. We've proved that these populations, again, ha are virus-like uh, particles because they, die with, they label also with a membrane dye. And so we then uh, plot, mix them together and plotted them out. Here it is on the uh, portion where my mouse is hovering that is on the Cytoflex S. We converted this experiment using the uh, SRT software into the SRT so that we could have two populations. And you can see they look somewhat differently, but that's simply because of scaling and how we decided to put them on the scale as the both of the systems are a seven log decade. And we just kind of stretched them out a little bit more here so we could, you know, for context basically, and for aesthetics when we're showing them in presentations such as this. And so we gated the two populations and Lo and behold, we were able to separate them out from one another. Hence, showing that if we could, you know, if you fluorescently tag these and it didn't matter, it doesn't matter. Um, we have access to TD tomatoes, GFPs, M cherries, um, just a multitude. And so it's, it's not difficult to start setting different populations or uh, virus like particles and separating them out. The uh, hopefully it's very easy to see on your screen is the middle as we did an overlay of the fluorescence uh, microscopy that was done to show how we have the again the VLPs in green and the VLPs in TD tomato and so very successful sort very successful experiment uh, and by no means am I naive enough to believe that this is the answer to every VLP uh, or nanoparticle problem. It was a fun experiment that we wanted to show that we could not only see virus-like particles, 
but that we could use them again as biological references, biological controls, and in part of our standardization protocols. And as is listed on the top, you can see that they are very nice because most of the things that you're looking at in extracellular vesicle populations these days, uh, according to NTA or pulse resistance sensing, are going to be in that 92 to 110, 120 nanometers with a refractive index somewhere around 1.39 to 1.42, which happens to be very similar to the platelet EVs and red blood cell EVs that are um, constantly uh, looked at and done, experimented on within, you know, the lab that I work with, Dr. Garon, and at, for our joint labs at the NIH and NCI. So again, very successful uh, that we had with this and we're going to be working further and hopefully prove that this is a viable method for the classification and the purification of virus-like particles and things of that nature. Now at this time, I'd like to turn the floor over to some more fun science um, to Cecilia. And so some things that I've been having the pleasure to work with her uh, in our lab. And so Cecilia? They're all yours. Thank you, John. Okay. So um, I would like to share some of uh, the experiments we've been doing and the characterization of the antibody response to a SARS-CoV-2 spike protein vaccine in mice. So this is not a vaccine that's been used in the clinic so far. It's just recombinant protein that we gave uh, animal models to just understand how the immune system responds to them. And I'd like to give you a little bit of background just before we go into the actual analysis of the B cells, uh, just to remind or present to whoever is new to the topic that when we have uh, a humoral immune response, so the antibody response. We have some antibodies that are always present in our bodies and any mammals, also mice, as well as humans. And then when we encounter some pathogen or antigen of any nature, we have a first response that is independent of uh, T cells and that generates lower affinity antibodies, but they're promptly there. So they're kind of a first line of defense, as we call them. And then after a longer time, we have the antibodies that come from uh, T-dependent response that you can see highlighted in the slide um, that are higher affinity, and they have been through the process of acquiring mutations to improve their affinity and their class switch. So we're mostly IgG that we're gonna be looking at. And a lot of people heard about this a lot recently because that's what we're aiming for with vaccines. So we wanna be able to generate those uh, antibodies that are high affinity, class switched and protective therefore. Okay, so high affinity antibodies are derived from B cells that undergo the process of selection and somatic hypermutation in germinal centers, which are these structures that are depicted here, and that I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about just because we're gonna look into this phenomenon. Um, so within the B cell follicles, B cells interact with T cells while well, they capture antibodies from follicular dendritic cells, the FDCs that you can see on the left corner, and then they present antigen to T cells. So both B and T cells have to recognize um, the antigen to be able to interact. And then from that interaction, B cells get a signal to proliferate and mutate their, their receptors, which will become the secreted antibodies. So after the interaction with T cells, B cells um, proliferate, divide and acquire mutations, and that might or not, may or may not right, increase the affinity of the antibody. And so they get to test that when they interact with T cells again. And so they go multiple rounds of interaction with T cells to check if the affinity of their receptor is increasing or not. And that's what we call selection. So the high affinity B cells end up getting a better survival signal and they proliferate even more. And then eventually at the end of that cycle, um, which is something we're still trying to understand uh, what are the factors that drive that. 
but eventually they become plasma cells or memory B cells. And those are the ones producing the protective antibodies we want to have in our serum circulating to protect us from pathogens and also the memory B cells that we want to keep in our system so that if we encounter the same uh, pathogen again, we'll, be, we'll get a quicker uh, response to it. So what we did in our mouse model is to give the mouse the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, just a recombinant protein, um, to, to trigger an immune response. And then 14 days later, which is enough time for that uh, process I just described to start happening, we harvest the lymph nodes that are draining the vaccination site. And then we do multiple analysis. As you can see here, we look for antibody, uh, serum antibodies. We also phenotype the cells by flow. And then what I want to talk about now is that we sort and culture single B cells so that we can assess what, what the antibodies they were producing looked like. So we'll go a little bit more into the specifics of that. So. Here's how our, our culture system works. So we, as I mentioned, take out the lymph nodes from the mice at day 14 after immunization, and then we sort single uh, germinal center B cells into a 96 well plate using the SRT in this case. And uh, we, first of all, we coat the plate with this feeder cells that provide signals for the B cells to survive. And then we sort the B cells on top of them and let the B cells go for six days. And then after that, we can assess, um, as you can see, the yellow wells in the picture by ELISA, we can assess which in which wells we had cells producing IgG. And then we can assess the specificity of those um, immunoglobulins to the spike protein that we gave to the mouse. And we can also harvest and freeze those cells to then extract RNA and get the sequences. So we can pair um, the specificity of the antibody with the sequence of the gene. And that's pretty much how you study uh, immunoglobulin repertoires because there are two uh, sides of it. And if you look at the DNA or the mRNA, you will know about the somatic hypermutation process. And then you need the protein to assess um, affinity and specificity. So here's one example uh, when we did it with all type mice and then we sorted a ton of cells. In this case, I'm showing 300, uh, but we did it uh, multiple times, different models. So we can see that from the 300 cells, 309 cells we sorted, about 25% of them were actually binding to the spike protein that we gave to the mouse. And then from these, we can also break it down. So the spike protein has two domains, S1 and S2, and the RBG, the receptor binding domain, is part of S1, and it is the part of the protein that the virus uses to enter the cell. So if you have an antibody that blocks this domain, it's most likely protective. So, so we can break it down and also assess the specificity to each specific domain. So we assess the specificity to S1, S2, and RBG. So in this case, S1 means not RBG, because RBG is part of S1 as well. So we can see that about half and half uh, of them are bind to S2 or S1 RBG. And a small fraction of them is you cannot detect the binding if you split the protein. And that could be because the affinity is lower, or it could also be because the epitope depends on um, the full configuration of the protein. So when you separate the domains, you lose that binding site. And so we can no longer see those antibodies binding to either one of the domains separate. So one thing we did to explore this system that we have up and running in the lab was to study the difference between a young adult mouse versus an aged mouse, because we know that for aged people, getting a good response to vaccines is sometimes challenging. So we wanted to understand why is that and why what's different in their immune system that makes it harder to respond uh, well to a vaccine. So we used the same strategy and we got cells out of um, young adult mice that we call young here, but they are adults and um, aged mice. And as you can see here, we did not um, find um, 
smaller fraction of the cells to be spike specific. So aged mice are also able to enrich their germinal centers for uh, spike specific cells. And they pretty much have the same distribution in terms of domains as the young adults, although they do have a few more um, not determined ones, which could mean lower affinity or um, that they bind to different epitopes than the young mice. And this is what we see by ELISA, just to give an idea of um, what the signal looks like when we uh, assess the specificity. And okay, so we harvested the cells also for sequencing. So we can assess from the mRNA, the levels of somatic hypermutation in those cells. And interestingly, we saw that on average, the aged B cells are also able to acquire um, mutations but what we found was kind of a dual pattern here. So we find a higher frequency of cells that did not acquire any mutations, but also a higher frequency of cells that acquired many mutations, which we called eight or more. So as you can see, there are what we call germline, which means not mutated at all. So their aged mice have more of those, but they also have more um, highly mutated cells, which are, have eight or more um, mutations in the in the BCR gene. So we find in aged mice that they're also able to uh, select for specific B cells in the germinal center and also able to accumulate mutations. So we're not yet sure about why is the response overall worse in aged mice. They do have a lower titer of antibodies in their serum as well, just like aged um, or elderly people, um, and but we're not. But it's not due to a deficiency in the selection process. At least it doesn't seem to be, as far as we could assess. And then another uh, example of uh, how we can further explore this uh, this technique or this protocol of culturing the the single cells. Um, we can also measure affinity because we have the B cells each one individually secreting their antibody in a single well. So when we collect that supernatant, we actually have a monoclonal antibody in, in each well. So, so what we did here in this case is not aged versus uh, young mice, but is a different mouse model where we can perturb the T cells. So in this case, the green um, pie chart shows that is a TFH deficient mouse. So in this mouse, we're able to remove the T cells that would be giving the B cells signal to proliferate and mutate. So I put in the right um, top the picture again, just to remind us that the B and T cell interaction is what drives the B cells to uh, proliferate and accumulate mutations. And in this case, in the green, uh, pie charts, we're showing that what happens when we remove those cells that are able to interact with the, T, uh, with the B cells in the germinal center. So as you can see, it reduces a lot the frequency of spike-specific cells. So we went from 40% to 10% more or less. And, uh, but those spike-specific ones are still able to bind um, RBD, which would be the protective, uh, most likely protective antibodies. And then on the far right on this slide, you can see that it's a KG measure, so it's an affinity measurement. So we were able to use those supernatants to um, measure affinities with biolayer interferometry. Um, and as you can see there with the green uh, dots, so in this case, the higher the dot, the lower is the affinity in the plot. Uh, so the higher the KG, the lower the affinity. Um, and so as you can see, when we remove the T cells, which means uh, in the green dots, we see lower affinity antibodies show up. So in the control levels, we have affinities that are pretty high down at the bottom, and which are the blue ones. And the green ones, as you can see, we have both. So some are still able to acquire higher affinity, but we also see some very low affinity antibodies uh, popping up. So we can actually um, show that we can reproduce the phenomenon that would be happening inside the lymph node in vitro um, by culturing the B cells and then looking at 
the effect of not having a T cell uh, in the mouse to participate in the affinity maturation process. So, so these are some of the questions that we've been addressing um, in the B and T cell communication and generation of um, high affinity antibodies and that we were able to do this using this um, single cell culture system. So with that, I wanna thank you for the attention and be happy to take any questions. Thank you, John, James, and Cecilia for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, what kind of plate filling efficiency do you see? In other words, how many wells actually grow cells as expected? Um, okay, so I think, well, I, I'd say that our efficiency is around 65% at best, but I think it's more on the viability of the cells. So these are activated cells and they're prone to die. So I don't think that wherever we don't see cells growing, it's not because they weren't sorted into the well, it's mostly because they just didn't survive. So, cause when I sequence them directly, I get pretty much close to 100% efficiency. So the culture adds another layer where biology plays a major role. So yeah, but at best around 65%, yeah. Thank you. Next question. Are there cleanup steps that can help with removing debris from VLP sample preps or are these pretty clean? No, there's lots of cleanup. I mean, they're pretty clean in the sense of, you know, it's a supernatant filled with, you know, virally infected, uh, cells basically, and then budding off. But um, you can use uh, basic size exclusion chromatography. Uh, there is uh, Captacore beads that will, that are used for viruses kind of exclusively with uh, from, I think it's GE puts them out. So there's definitely some cleanup methods that need to be done um, to purify. And then as we said in the talk, um, you do have that problem of things that are same size and in basically density being problematic also. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, next question, and this is for John. Is the ACO49 dye that you used available commercially? And if so, what is the full name? Um, ACO dyes are uh, available commercially through the company Acarella. Um, so if you, Let's see, I believe it's A-C-O-E-R-E-L-A uh, dot com. Um, I don't know if I should, if someone can type that in, so I don't have to try to figure out how to do that. Um, it is available uh, through the website, um, and also I believe there's contact information for uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Joel Cox, um, who is kind of sort of the lead from that group to do that. So, and they have many different... Um, colors on that, I think from UV excitation through uh, infrared and actual infrared, uh, not, not just the far red, but actual, you know, in the thousand, um, so. All right, thank you. Uh, next question, and this is for John. Can you separate BLPs from EVs without a fluorescent label? BLPs from EVs without a fluorescent label. No, not that I, well, what's the correct scientific answer? Not in my hands have I been able to do this as of yet. Uh, you'd have to do something to differentiate between those with and without spike proteins. Um, and I think that's difficult without actual labeling. I mean, the whole point of using a virus like this, a BLP, uh, is a an exosome kind of mimic um, for standardization. And I believe uh, 
the most common one to use uh, is the recombinant EVs that Sigma puts out. It was the originals from uh, on Hendrix, uh, and that paper is out there to see exactly how they are made. So I'm going to say no. All right. Next question. What methods do you use to deplete EVs from your VLP preps? Again, that's very difficult. And this, I think, is why we see them hovering in. And when we've had discussions with the group from National University of Singapore um, and now the Acarella company, uh, it is thought that that's just the, the EVs that are transferring in. So obviously, in the cleanup methods, it's extremely difficult because well, there's a lot of reasons and I'm sure out of the scope of just this answer. Um, so it is very hard to do anything with the cleanup because if you do a size exclusion, and basically they're the same size. Um, if you do a density gradient, the density is the same. You know, anything refractive index, same. So they make great EV mimics. All right, thank you. Um, next question. What is the lower limit of sorting BLPs could you sort norovirus VLPs, which are about 30 to 45 nanometers? Um, I don't know because I haven't tried and it's about, you know, just trying. We have, which we haven't shown here because of what this topic was about. We have done some um, OMVs, which are the bacterial uh, derived extracellular vesicles and by using dyes and, and stuff, you can pick them out. Now, what you'd have to do is transfer over to using more of a fluorescence triggering than you would scatter. Scatter, the limited detection of the instrument, I don't think you get anywhere near it. Um, but by triggering fluorescence, you can probably pick up either those that um, are super bright or I'm not going to deny that it's possible that if there's any clustering, it actually benefits you in this instance. All right. Thank you. Next question, if trying to start VLP experiments, would you recommend having a Beckman Coulter technician set up the parameters on the Cytoflex instrument for optimal resolution? Um, I think, I mean, you kind of have to have them uh, really fine tune the instrument. Now, this has been an ongoing debate um, on best practices in, the, in this instance. And a lot of it obviously is going to fall down on the technician themselves of having the uh, proper standards and, you know, understanding the instrument. But yeah, without a, a tuned instrument in the first place, you're never going to get anywhere close to where you need to be. Um, fortunate for us, we have just a great team here that understands what's the, what we expect from our instruments and bring them to that kind of gold standard. So. Uh, having a great relationship with your engineer is probably the first and, and foremost uh, step to your success. All right, great. Thank you. Next question, and this is for John. Were these particles more abundant, do you still need to do a lot of post-sort concentration? I don't have reference to what the particles are referring to. Okay, so I'm just going to make some assumptions. Um, and say that even though they are abundant, it really depends on what your downstream application is. So if you are trying to look for particular cargo, if you're looking for particular subsets, um, you're really going to want to do some sorting and tease it out based on whether it's a, a surface protein or some sort of uh, RNA that is internal to the actual particle. Um, if we're talking about just kind of, let's just call them, I guess, uh, hydrogels or something like that, that's different. You're hoping you have homogeneous populations. So, but if it's something that's kind of, we're talking either EV, exosome, virus-like particle, you need something to characterize them because in these preps, like we said, you're going to end up with other stuff in there. So you want to be more specific. All right. Great. Thank you. And we will wrap up with that question. Thank you, John, James, and Cecilia. Do you have any final comments for our audience? James? I, yeah, I think the only thing I would say is uh, thank you everyone for attending. I really appreciate your questions and, um, and interaction. And uh, yeah, thank you very much to Cecilia and John for sharing your work. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope everyone found it as interesting as I did. Thank you, James.
Um, I would just say, because, you know, when someone asks, can you do this? Can you do that? Um, it's science. We try to have some fun with it. So if you can think about it, try it. I mean, worst case scenario is it, it doesn't work. And well, that's 98% of all science. So <laughs> yeah, just have fun with it. Oh boy. I, oh, do you want me to ask this? There's one question that came in real quick. Should I ask this one? We, we do have a, just a couple more minutes. Um, so thank you for the great overview. Would it be possible to comment on the feasibility and logistics of sorting enough NP-like material for downstream analysis, example, proteomic sequencing, et cetera? Okay, from experience, um, I'm going to say that for these type analysis, it, it depends on the actual thing, um, what you're doing downstream. PCRs, I think we've gotten away with doing about, sorting out about 40,000 uh, positive particles um, for things such as proteomics, that number went up somewhere around 100,000, possibly if more would be better. Um, but I think rule of thumb and from uh, working with uh, Jennifer Jones on some sorting projects previously, uh, you end up to get a, what you would think in the same as a cellular assay like Cecilia was talking about, where you can do you know singles and get this. It doesn't work the same. You can actually end up sorting for upwards of 72 hours. All right. Well, thank you again, John, James, and Cecilia for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Also, we encourage you to answer the interest poll questions at the bottom of your screen. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone, goodbye.